Welcome back. When it comes to shaping the housing market, there's a distinction to be made between homeowners, people who buy a house to live in, and investors who already live somewhere else. Here's a look at the growing role of investor owners by the numbers. According to the Bank of Canada, investors now make up about 30% of mortgage holders, where an investor is described as a home buyer who obtains a mortgage while holding one on another property. About 42.5% of the market is still first-time buyers, but that is a decline from more than 50% in 2014. And repeat home buyers, those who trade one mortgage for another, is also a shrinking share at 27.5% today, down from just shy of 30% nine years ago. Meanwhile, house flipping is on the rise again, with 2.5% of homes resold within 12 months after collapsing during pandemic. Meanwhile, expectations for prices are rising again. After falling in 2022, buyers and sellers see prices gaining 4.34% over the next 12 months across Canada. Well, there's no question that investors are playing a growing role in our housing market. But is it a good thing or a bad thing? Some argue that investors are an essential piece of the puzzle to getting more homes built, especially in capital-intensive places like condos. Murtaza Haider is a professor of data science and real estate management at the Toronto Metropolitan University. Murtaza, great to have you with us. My pleasure. So uh, we do see this growing number of investors. Uh, why is it important that that uh, money be at the table? It's critical for real estate um, to to have investors in the in this space. Um, consider just the rental housing. One in three Canadians live in a rental housing, and that rental housing is provided by investors. Somebody invests in real estate and then make that rental unit available to others who can rent from it. You take out the investors, where will that rental unit come from? There are millions of Canadians in rental units, thanks to investors. Same is the case with uh, with new construction. Now, if you think about construction, it takes years to get the approvals, and then the financing risk, there's a construction risk, there's a construction cost risk. Mm -hmm. All of those risks are assumed by investors. Where are the households who would say, no, I would like to assume all those risks and wait for five or six years for a condominium to be constructed, and then you sit on the sidelines waiting for those buildings to be built. Right. So investors step in, and they provide the, the necessary capital and assume the risks until such time that a unit is created so take them out and you have no real estate building would you make a distinction between uh, that kind of patient capital that's willing to make a, a big capital outlay and then wait uh, as we need for some of these big projects and an investor that is say an individual buying a second property and selling it within a year in other words when we see the increase in flipping in real estate is that a different category for you or would you put them in the same boat no, I will put them in in uh, different boats. Uh, those who are investing for flip uh, for to be able to gain uh, profits in a short term, they are just benefiting from an asset that is increasing in value. It is not restricted in stocks and bonds. And why would we restrict in uh, restrict those in real estate? It's an asset class for those, and 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 that's how it works. And so, well, I guess the question then some might ask is, should it be an asset class like others in the sense that unlike a stock or a bond, uh, there's a basic human need and a right to housing? Have we created a financialization problem where we've made this an asset class when maybe it should be less of one? Housing is as much a, a human right as food is, but I don't think any government is going to go to Loblaws or Westons and others and say that this is how much you're going to charge for, for bread and, and lettuce. And that's not how it works. The question is people provide funds to for these products to be created. If those investors are removed or are um, put under uh, additional constraints, they may invest otherwise, and then you won't have any construction happening. Mm -hmm. So that's a critical thing to realize. And let's just look at Paris. People love to go to Paris and look, walk through those boulevards and look at those uh, beautiful uh, facades. And it is important to realize that most of that construction that happened about 100 plus years ago was funded by investors and speculators. So this is how you got Paris. This is how construction has been happening. We just have to get to used to it. Mortiza, great to have you with us. Always appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Mortiza Haider is a professor at Toronto Metropolitan University. So while some argue that investors play a critical role in the housing markets, others say that that kind of thinking is part of the financialization of housing, and that's transformed something that is a basic human right into a commodity to trade. Julieta Peruca is deputy director at The Shift. Julieta, great to have you with us.
Thank you. It's my pleasure. So we do know that for a lot of people, homes are a place to make money, and that includes the house we live in, but also this increasing role of investors that buy other properties or invest in big projects. What's the danger of that as far as you're concerned? Well, I think it's a huge danger. I mean, we've been seeing it play out in Canada over the last 30 years and prices are becoming increasingly unaffordable and we're all asking ourselves why, but we're not really thinking about these investors who are coming in with huge swaths of capital and just planting it into our housing systems to drive unaffordability. I think we're also not questioning the business model of investors. Investors and uh, residential real estate corporations have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to create maximum wealth and profit for those shareholders. So these are the exact things that, that lead into business tools like the, um, the application for above guideline rental increases, evictions of low income tenants for, for higher income tenants, and things like rent evictions or repositioning what is affordable housing into luxury units. These are all the things that are driving unaffordability and are driving the housing crisis. So we, I mean, an interesting um, parallel is made with food. Also a basic human right, also something we let the market manage because it's the most efficient way to produce enough food for everybody. Uh, do you think that's an apt comparison with housing? Uh, or do, could we look at food and say, actually, we do pay pretty close attention to the profitability of food, food uh, grocers and, uh, um, and producers? And the government might step in if you saw 50, 60, 100% increases in that profitability over time. Should we have kind of similar watchfulness around housing that we do around other sectors? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, I don't think it's an apt comparison whatsoever. And I think that one thing that we need to remember is that housing is currently the biggest business in the entire world. It's worth 217 trillion US dollars or almost four times the world's global GDP. And food, unfortunately, is not that. It does not attract as much capital as housing does. And I think because of that reason, we need to have a very watchful eye over our housing market. Because as you've said quite rightly, housing is a human right and it needs to be treated as such both by governments, but also by those very investors who are huge players and are having an outsized impact on our housing markets. So we, of course, know from the most recent economic data that the housing real estate related industries is now the single biggest sector of our economy, bigger than any mm -hmm. other, including manufacturing resources, uh, financial services. The problem, of course, that might present, Julieta, is there's a vested interest of an awful lot of us in keeping things exactly the way they are. How much of an uphill climb is that when you think about shifting uh, the mentality around housing and how we build homes? Yeah, I think it's a huge uphill climb. And I think, you know, it's it's difficult because we don't have so many examples that we can point to that have made this paradigmatic shift. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to start looking at our economic, our economy and trying to figure out how we can make housing a productive part of our economy. And I think where maybe we're lacking some innovation is there actually are a lot of ways in which we can go through, for example, the green transitioning of our built environment that would really drive our economy in a positive direction, as well as our climate targets. But instead of that, I think what we're doing is relying on just investments in housing to drive our GDP. So it's going to take huge political will to try to re reorient our housing systems to one that is actually resilient, that is actually accessible for everyone in Canada, both now and into the future. Julieta, great to have you for this. Really appreciate your time. No, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Julieta Peruca is Deputy Director at The Shift. Coming up, the U.S. government is taking on Google. If they win, do we all lose? That's still ahead.